Hi, I'm Bethany Qualls, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of English at UC Davis. For my project, Recovering the Forgotten Women of Metal Type Design, I partnered with Letterform Archive in San Francisco. Professor Susan Verba and Design served as my faculty mentor. So why should we think about typography and design from so long ago? Well, design shapes how information is absorbed across media forms. So today's typographic design connects directly to the metal type era, which was roughly from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. The women's more recent computer age contributions are publicly recognized. Susanna Lichko was the first person ever to design a typeface on a computer, and Susan Kerr created the first typefaces for Apple in the 1980s. The contributions of women in the metal type era have mostly been erased or ignored. First though, what is metal type? So print's been around for centuries. The earliest forms we know about is woodblock printing in China around 200 CE. In 1041, Bi Shang invented the first movable type using clay blocks held in a frame. And then in the 1440s, Johannes Gutenberg secretly invented his printing press with cast metal type and printed those famous Bibles. I'm not gonna get into all the technical parts here, but this kind of type stays roughly the same for almost 500 years. Each letter is cast metal from a matrix, then set by hand. That is, until the invention of line casting, a new method of hot metal typesetting. Instead of reusing the same letters over and over again, linotype and monotype machines, both invented in the 1880s, create brand new letters that are automatically typeset by machines. I'll let some clips from this 1947 overview of printing careers show you what that means. These are first, composition the preparation of the type or other matter to be printed for the presses. Second, press work, the actual printing of the composed matter on paper or some other substance. And third, bindery work, the folding or joining together of the printed sheets into various forms so that they may be sent to the public. In the composing room of a good-sized printing firm, the duties are divided among several employees. Although a great part of today's type is set mechanically, hand compositors are employed by all large commercial printing plants, newspapers, and publishing houses. Hand compositors usually set the large type, called display line, used in advertisements and other printed matter. Linotypes and other typesetting machines are used for the part of the copy called straight matter, consisting of many lines of the same length and size of type. The linotype operator manipulates a keyboard to assemble lines of characters which come in contact with molten type metal to produce lines or slugs of type. Some printing firms have monotype machines which consist of two separate units, the keyboard and the casting machine. When the monotype keyboard operator presses the keys, punches driven by compressed air perforate a paper ribbon at the top of the machine. When the operator finishes, the ribbon is removed and placed in the casting machine. The perforated paper controls the movements of the machine, causing it to produce individual type characters set in properly spaced lines. There are so before we get too much deeper into what's happening here, some key terms that are useful to know. Foundries, companies that make a font. A font is a vessel for the letter form design. Um, and a typeface is the design that you see on the page or the screen. Um, it's the end product. So in our digital age, the terms font and typeface are basically used interchangeably because often we're not using bits of metal to make our type go. Um, but you can think about this as a font is to an MP3 as a typeface is to a song. So you generally say you love the song and not the way that it's delivered. Thanks to Stephen Coles for that analogy. And now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's keep it moving. This project's purpose is to foreground women's contributions internationally to the historically male-dominated disciplines of typography and design. Recognizing women's role in typography and design since the late 1800s provides more concrete links between them and the broader consumption of information and production of knowledge, both in the past and in the present. There are multiple designers that many people know about, like Elizabeth Freelander and Gundren Zaff von Hesse. They both had long careers in 20th century graphic design. 
But who else worked in this space? There had to be more than just a few women, right? Who were they? Where did they work? What did they make? This is what we wanted to find out. Letterform Archive has been doing typography education since they opened in 2015, and their most popular request is for early type design materials by women. So my Melon Scholars project was to help them create not just a finding aid for their current holdings of materials made by women, but a resource that pulled together as much information about these women of metal type design as possible from across the web, digital archives, and in print. To be clear, I wasn't starting from scratch. Multiple people have dug into this question, all building on what came before. A 1997 master's thesis by Laura Weber is foundational, as is this blog post and resource list from Alphabets. Some women in metal type show up in histories of women of graphic design, along with ongoing research projects like that by Fiona Ross and Alice Savoy into women who worked behind the scenes at Monotype. Yulia Popova's book, published earlier in 2021, gives a brief overview of most known women, while Lauren L. Tegain, whose Bird's Rest site was super helpful for my research, defended a master's thesis on this very topic in September 2021. My project this summer was twofold. List the bound type specimens, and then do research on women in metal type. The first big task I faced was to list out Letterform's collection of bound type specimens, something that has been on their list of things to do for years. At last count, I listed 688 objects on these shelves, putting down their title, foundry, and date, along with any other information that seemed like it would help my project. Thankfully, I got to start out in languages I speak, English and French, before getting to Italian, German, and Dutch publications. Google Translate really helped me here, distinguish between words that were actually names versus terms like incorporated. These specimens span from the 1850s to the 1970s. But wait, what's a bound type specimen? Well, these are some. Foundries, again, those places that would literally cast type into fonts, they would put out sample books of the different typefaces that you could buy from them. So the books would include the range, maybe broken into volumes by style, also, individual type specimens are another way foundries to show off their typefaces. These are more like pamphlets that show the typeface in different sizes and use in design samples. Working through this collection of type specimens underlined historic changes, like when American type foundries bought basically everyone uh, because all these little foundries didn't have publications after that acquisition. The second part of this project was to go synthesize the research and information that already exists about women who did metal type design. I did this a little while going through the bound type specimens, and then it became my main focus. Basically my task was to find out what some people already know, then see what I could further build out. I consulted multiple secondary materials, working on a massive spreadsheet to organize the information. Often I was able to locate more period materials than I found cited elsewhere, thanks in part to sources like HathiTrust, Archive.org, and the International Advertising and Design Database. Then, with everything listed and my notes fairly, um, organized, I went through my specimen list and the rest of Letterform's collection, gathering type specimens and looking to see what examples of the typefaces by women I could find. I flagged everything I could get my hands on for ease of access in the future, cross-referencing both individual and bound specimens, and locating other source material connected to these women. Most of the designers did more than just typeface design. Gundren Zaff von Hesse and Friedel Thomas both ran book binderies. Many, like Elizabeth Caldwell and Ilse Shula, also worked as illustrators and graphic designers. Others, like Hildegard Henning and Lena Berger, did hand lettering. All this information in hand, I worked with Letterform to create a finding aid page template, then wrote out a page for each woman. These pages include biographical information, typefaces designed, later digital versions, what Letterform holds, and what I could find outside of their collection. These pages are not yet live, but we will be putting together a virtual exhibit on their online archive that highlights these women in 2022. Please stay tuned. There are a few big surprises over the course of this summer. For one, I didn't realize that most of the known women in type design lived in what's now Germany. So most of my research was in German, a language I don't speak, until I got to Brosh's work, which is all in Hebrew. Ditto. Then came the Russians, and this uh, is one of the big gaps in the current materials about women in metal type, is those who worked in non-Latin characters. So the former USSR, now Russia, had many women leading design work at Polygraph Mash, which was the USSR's single type foundry. 
But most of that work is only in Russian, which is why I think they've not made it onto the roundups of early women type designers thus far. For example, Galina Banakova turned up in my early notes from looking at that blog by Lauren Degain. Thanks again. But Banakova wasn't in the books I was consulting as the basis for my research. Thankfully, before my final synthesis, I went back, saw her name, dug in more, and bam! All these Cyrillic fronts. Plus, so many more women. Take Elena Zaragovotseva, for example, who created multiple foundry typefaces in the 1950s and 60s, some of which were turned to digital typefaces in the 1990s and 2000s for paratype by yet more women. Incredible. Many thanks to Alexa Yermakova for her amazing support in working through all these non-OCR text and finding me digital facsimiles of style guides and other resources for work these women created, all in Russian. Another thing I realized is that type technology doesn't have a quick overview, and I needed to understand how the simultaneity worked, like how foundry type and linotype and monotype were all happening together. So I was getting confused and figured others might too. So I wrote up the text and resources for a timeline with the help from Stephen Coles that will turn into a visual resource. And lastly, a thing that was really amazing was just the kindness of people, both in letter form and out in the world, who emailed me back, helped me find stuff, shared their unpublished research, um, sent words of encouragement on Twitter, it was just, it was really great. Uh, and clearly a lot of people are interested and I'm really excited to see what happens with this material once it's out in the world. So what's next? Well, the Finding Aid for Women in Metal Type Era should be live in 2022. You can find it and more incredible examples of letter forms in Letter Forms Online Archive. Definitely check it out. Thanks again to everyone who helped make this project possible, including those who designed the typefaces I used in this presentation. Have any information you'd like to share about women in metal type from the late 1800s to mid-1900s? Interested in learning more about these women? Have other questions? Let us know! You can find both Letterform and me on social media or by email. We would love to hear from you.